Good evening, folks, and a hearty welcome to our drive-in theater. We have a wonderful evening's entertainment lined up for you, one that will provide several hours of pleasurable relaxation and diversion for you and your family. Did you fail to dress up for tonight's show? No tie, an old shirt and slacks, a house dress? Well, don't give it a thought. We're glad you came as you are. We just want you to enjoy yourselves. Don't forget to visit our refreshment center during the intermission or any time. You love the tasty array of snacks we have to offer. So will the youngsters. Everything is quality and mm -hmm, so good. We hope you'll make this a weekly visit. Bring the family. Bring your friends. There are always wonderful new pictures to see, delightful snacks to nibble, a gay, pleasant evening for all. Oh, a word of caution. Don't drive over 10 miles an hour in the theater area for your safety's sake. And mom or pop, go with the kids when they leave the car. We hope you have a wonderful time. Come back soon. Well, pull up a chair and set a spell here at Tales from SYL Ranch Live, the vlogcast that reminds you to always know where your towel is. And I'm your host, Bill Stone. Well, I'm very happy to be here. This is the very first vlogcast edition, vlogcast edition of Tales from SYL Ranch here on Periscope. And I'm very glad if any of my regular viewers may have followed me over from YouTube to here, and also to any of my new Periscope users who may have been joining me from Periscope or Twitter for the very first time. The show had been previously hosted on YouTube. However, remaining with YouTube in the last few months has become completely problematic. YouTube had made repeated scurrilous copyright reassignments, made repeated scurrilous um, community guidelines and abuse strikes. They had deleted the original channel and all 300 plus videos that had been on it. And they issued a lifetime ban on my primary account from which I could no longer even be a viewer. So going forward, this vlogcast is going to be live here on Periscope. Streams will be retained here on Periscope as well as archived over to bitshoot.com. So thank you very much for watching at Tales from SYL Ranch here on Periscope. I think you'll probably enjoy the show. It's different from most of what else I'm seeing here on Periscope. Mostly I do reviews, very in-depth reviews of science fiction, fantasy, superhero, and uh, TV shows, movies, and uh, motion pictures. So explain my show, for those of you who may be joining for the first time or who might not pop in right on the hour, I do live reviews. Sometimes I do serious films and TV, sometimes I do schlock just for the kicks of it, and sometimes I review things with a broad appeal like Star Wars movies, Marvel movies, and tonight Doctor Who. I usually, however, stick to a period from about 1900 to 1980, and that's the period because the period after 1980 is pretty well documented, what with the great science fiction we got after Star Wars and all the great technology that allows us to even do the documentation. But there is a lot of science fiction and a lot of science fiction fandom that isn't very well documented from 1900 to 1980. And so part of the reason I do the show is to document it. I will take any and all questions, comments, and nasty remarks. I will respond to as many of my viewers as possible. You can tell me if I miss something, if I'm completely full of crap, or if I just happen to be an amazingly hoopy frood, which is probably more likely. Now, I do go into a lot more depth than most reviewers. I don't just talk about whether I like the film or not. I talk about acting and cinematography and direction, sometimes the mechanics of making a film. And I can do this because a long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, I was once an actor. Now, I can speak with a little authority, not as much authority as a modern working actor, and I never want to make that impression, but with some authority. As they often say, those who can do and those who can't teach. And I think probably reviewing the way that I do kind of falls under the heading of teaching. But this is a mini review. This is my Doctor Who mini review, which is made within about three or four hours of my having watched it. Uh, those of you who just finished watching it on BBC America, hello to you. You hopefully will get to see one of the first reviews. I do not go into the same kind of time or depth as I do on my Monday reviews, like I will tomorrow, but I think you'll find it's probably more depth than you're seeing from other reviewers in any case. 
So, today on the Fandai Masters show, we have my review of Doctor Who Season 11, Episode 5, The Saranga Conundrum. Now, as a non-spoiler review, I can say, wow, we're actually about halfway through this series. In fact, we're exactly halfway through this series after tonight's episode. Now, I do like this episode, which is a good thing. After last week, which simply enraged me, I was worried that Chris Chibnall was maybe not going to be able to deliver as a writer. But he did deliver as a writer. And I found this episode kind of moving, which is something that doesn't happen all that much for reasons that I'll explain in my spoiler card. Because I've kind of seen it all. And you just wait to find out how much I've seen it all. Wait for my birthday on uh, January 14th. I am doing my very first centennial, that is 100th anniversary, review of a film. As I say, I kind of seen it all. Anyway... I thought the episode was moving in several ways, despite the fact that I kind of did see a lot of it coming. But I also liked the performances. I liked the fact that we got to see some more character development of Ryan. I was kind of afraid, and I'll talk about that too to some extent, that uh, three companions in only ten episodes uh, would make that kind of difficult. And I think it may still be. But I did generally find this a very good episode. So with that said, I'll issue myself a... (laughs) Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. All hands, prepare for incoming spoilers. Yes, it is a spoiler alert, and that is because I am the Fandai Master. And that means that the fandom is strong with me. And that means that nothing is new, nothing is original, and at worst, I figure it out about a half an hour early. This is sadly not a boast nor a brag. This is unfortunately where you find yourself after having watched, read, and listened to more than a hundred years worth of science fiction. You just can't see all the new stuff for the entire century that came before, and sometimes it does interfere with your ability to enjoy things. And I have to say, I pretty much caught this one about half an hour early. But that's okay. Now, if you're sitting through this spoiler alert, we will assume that you know what the uh, plot of this episode was. If you not don't know, if you haven't seen it or you care to, well, be aware I'm about to spoil the whole thing. Now, a lot of times, particularly on my Monday reviews, I'll go into a lot of detail about the plot. I'm not going to do that again on these reviews because they're made so shortly after the episode actually aired. I mean, it just finished airing an hour ago, something like that, on BBC America. I see him way earlier than that. BitTorrent! Excuse me. BitTorrent! Excuse me. Um... So I'm not going to sit and talk about the plot here. We'll just assume, if you're sitting past the spoiler alert, that you have seen uh, this show. So one thing I always like to get out of my way right off the bat is I like to get my cringe moments out of the way. And there were a few this time around. A lot of them had to do with the ship. Really? There's no pilot? Seriously, no pilot on this ship? I mean, come on, man. Even ambulances have drivers. You would think they would put, like, a pilot on board just for backup, you know, just in case. Just saying. Also, blowing up the hospital? That seems kind of extreme. Um, You know, in the event of hostility or hijack, right, they're going to blow this thing up. I mean, you just kill everybody, the patients and everything? Literally? Death is actually preferable to being hijacked or taken by hostiles? I mean, couldn't the hostiles just be wanting ransom or something? You know? Maybe they're just there to steal drugs. You really think it's worth dying? You're going to kill all your patients just for that? that? That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I mean, even the case of a quarantine, you know, say if something goes really bad and the ship's just filled with sick people, you got to quarantine. Well, okay, all you really need to do in that instance is keep people, keep the ship away from everything. You know, it's really hard for most things to uh, travel through the vacuum of space. The fact that they happen to find, like, the one unusual instance this time where it might have traveled across the vacuum of space is um, pretty unusual. You know, most of the time, just say, you can't dock here. Go away. Go about 10 light years off. Blow it up? That that, that seems a little bit much. To be honest, it seemed to me, uh, dramatically, like adding a ticking clock 
that maybe didn't necessarily need to be there. Maybe we didn't need a ticking clock on this one. Maybe we could have put it in some other way. So by putting a bomb on the ship, it just seemed like a way to add a ticking clock that maybe didn't need to be here. Another cringe moment, I had to wonder, why would a pilot, and especially a general, not respect an engineer? I mean, surely she knows that without engineers, pilots and generals can't do their jobs. I mean, piloting is great, but if your stuff is broken or if it doesn't work very well, you're not going to be piloting anything anywhere. <laughs> The pace this time around seemed a little frantic. Um, I know in previous ones, if you've seen me over on YouTube, I do talk about uh, how I thought we were going to see more fast-paced stuff after Capaldi because simply because of Pat Capaldi's age. You know, he's about my age. Simply because of his age, he couldn't do all that running around that doctors since 2005 up and through Matt Smith had been able to do. Um, you know, if you gave me the job of playing the doctor, which they'll never do because I'm an American, but if you were to give it to me, the shooting schedule alone would kill me. I mean, I'd be dead because of the shooting schedule more than anything else. But certainly all that running around, you know, even what you see the doctor doing here, that would be tough for me to keep up. I would be have a hard time keeping up that amount of running. So I'm happy that the pace has gone back to the more fast-paced stuff that we're used to seeing with the doctor. However, this time, it maybe seemed a little too fast-paced, and maybe that was just because I'm an American. Um, I was I found it a little bothersome, mostly because I think I, you know, as an American, I'm not really used to various various individual British dialects because there are there's multiple British dialects out there. Um, so for me, it was a little bit difficult from time to time when the characters are just rattling through really fast for me to be able to follow all of the dialogue. Um, but aside from that, you know, it was still okay from that perspective. So those are my cringe moments. I like to talk about great moments, things that I liked very much. Uh, the Doctor and uh, the General, Eve Cicero, in general. I liked that. Uh, the fact that the Doctor knows her from something called the Book of Celebrants and is incredibly impressed by it, thus telling the viewer that we should be incredibly impressed was kind of fun. Uh, the fact that everybody seemed to know the Doctor um, probably from this book of celebrants or some kind of by reputation. Um, you know, I thought that was pretty good. I thought that was pretty good. And the fact that there's, in the book of celebrants, there's an entire volume on the doctor, which, considering all the stuff the doctor has done over the last 50 years, makes a certain level of sense. One of the other nice things I liked about this was piloting the starship with your brain. Now, as I said, I have watched, read, and listened to more than 100 years' worth of science fiction. So, I have seen this before. I have seen this in a little piece of crap movie that I hope you never see, and that I will not be reviewing even as schlock, uh, called uh, Starship Invasions. Uh, this is a terrible, terrible low-budget 1977 movie. I don't remember. I think it must have come out shortly after Star Wars, but it certainly doesn't compete. It's terrible. It starred Christopher Lee, amazingly enough, and Robert Vaughn, amazingly enough. But the best you can say about Starship Invasions is they had Christopher Lee and Robert Vaughn money. That was about all. Um, I do like this notion, and this picture, by the way, is a screen grab I got this afternoon. Uh, that little white panel you've seen that guy with his hand on, that's how they control the ships with their minds. You know, they didn't have all that wiring up that they did in this episode. They just put their hands on a panel. I kind of like that better, to be honest. But I understand why they did it here. I mean, how many times do we see that, really, in science fiction, at least on television, even in movies? We don't see it that much. It's something that's an idea I wish they would use a lot more because it's got to be, I mean, the ship's got to be a ton more responsive. It's got to be a hell of a lot more efficient in terms of how you do things. I, I, I like the idea. I wish that they had uh, kept using it. I think that's kind of cool. Interesting other bit of uh, uh, great moments here. One you may not know. I didn't know until I went to research it. This creature that we see here, the Pating, that was actually named after a writer, Tim Pierce, who had worked in the uh, uh, story room early on in this season's uh, development. So that's I think it's always kind of cool when you can, you know, throw in a little Easter egg like that that maybe average viewer wouldn't know, so that's kind of fun. 
Getting into some of the details. Our writer this time around, as was the case the last couple of times. Pardon me for a second. I want to check something. I want to see if I'm getting uh, any... My voice synchronization is uh, off at all here. Sometimes I have uh, issues with that, and I'm, you're going to be able to hear it echo. Right Yikes. Yikes. Sorry. You're probably getting a badass echo here. Okay. I muted it again. S sorry about that, Beneth. Okay, Ryder again on this episode as it was the last, what, couple of times, I guess. Chris Chibnall. Well, after last week, if you watched the review last week on YouTube, and it is the last Doctor Who review that is ever going to be on that channel because they'll throw me off again if they find out. Because YouTube sucks. After last week and having uh, had... Chibnall rather pissed me off with that episode. I and and kind of being uh, a little bit on the generic side a couple of times out. I was a little worried that we were going to discover that he couldn't deliver at all. But he he delivered here. This one, this one was fine, aside from the frenetic pace and a couple of other things I'm going to have to you know throw in his feet. I I thought that it was pretty good. Um, the biggest problem that I had with it was adding this ticking clock where it really didn't seem to be necessary, uh, or at least you maybe could have done it in a different way because um, it didn't make a hell of a lot of sense to me. <laughs> I don't know, blowing up your hospital full of patients uh, just seems a little bit over the top to me. So our performances... Well, we have Jodie Whittaker again as the Doctor, as we will all through this season and probably for a while continuing. Uh, you know, I, I've watched a fair amount of female reviewers and a fair amount of female reactors. Um, reaction videos are one of my guilty pleasures. Uh, there are certain people I like to watch who react. And, um, you know, ladies, I just have to tell you that for once... It's my turn. It is my turn to feel okay that the doctor's kind of hot. <laughs> it's okay for me, A, because she's female, and I can go ahead and say these things now, and I'm not gay. And uh, the other reason is she's, she's close enough to my age that it doesn't come off as though I'm being weird and creepy. So, in terms of her performance here, however, I think she did, as usual, a fine performance. One of the things that I like about her that they made more clear in this episode is that she's kind of a geek. Um, she really gets off on that antimatter drive, and uh, I get a kick out of that. As a geek, as a complete geek, I get a big kick out of the fact that she gets a kick out of that antimatter drive. And it helps me identify more with her because of this. Probably cements what may be a coming love relationship with this character. Uh, as Graham, played by Bradley Walsh, I continue to like Bradley Walsh's performance, and I continue to like Graham in gen general. I've said in previous reviews, but I'll repeat it here because, hey, it's the first time I've been on Periscope. Um, I, like, I, I like Graham. I like him for a number of reasons, but one of these is the fact that, uh, you know, he's an older guy. He's, he's sort of my age. Um, probably he could be younger than me at this point. I don't know anymore. It's impossible for me to tell looking at people. Uh, but I get a kick out of the fact that the doctor has somebody my age floating around with her. Um, to be honest, if they got rid of the other two companions, I wouldn't find any huge fault in it. <laughs> I like this companion more than I do some of the others. And I do personally identify him a lot with him a lot. I like how he just takes everything in stride, you know. Oh, you got a pregnant man that you have to be a midwife for? Uh, no problem, no problem. Oh, we're four days flight away from the TARDIS? Eh, that's a setback. It's not the worst thing in the universe. So I like how he does that. Otherwise, this episode, he doesn't have a whole lot of character development, and I will talk about that in a second very directly uh, and why that may be to some extent. So, as Yasmin Khan, again, Amanda Gill, um, she does a fine performance. I have no problem with her performance here. 
it is a once again, and we're getting all the way through halfway through the season, and it is not her episode. Now, next week it will be her episode, clearly, from what they've shown us in terms of, you know, the previews and all of that. Next week is clearly going to be her episode. But, um, you know, we had to wait six episodes to get it. I have mentioned in prior reviews on YouTube, you know, not everybody gets this, but since 2005, Doctor Who has been less about the Doctor and more about the Doctor's companions. They're the ones that get the most character development. Not that the Doctor doesn't get character development, but usually it's the companions, and usually it's sort of how the adventures that they have with the Doctor affect them and change them as people. So the problem is now, instead of only one companion, we have three companions. And so three companions and only 10 episodes to do character development may not be enough. And I think we've started to see it because we had to wait until episode six out of 10 to get any real char character development with Yaz. We do not know at this point what motivates her, what she wants. I mean, other than she apparently doesn't particularly like having to get along with her family, but the way it's written, well, it's not all that unusual. I mean, it's not, it's not like they're abusive or anything like that to her. There's no indication that anything like that has ever happened. It's just kind of their pain in the behind to have to deal with from time to time. Well, who can't say that about, you know, a lot of their own family for that matter. Uh, so again, we just don't really know much about her as a character. And we're having to wait until next week to get it six episodes in. Now, as Ryan, as always, we have Tosin Cole. And again, he gives another good performance here. Uh, we are given a little bit more of his character this time around. Although, to be honest, I kind of saw it coming. And it pays off. And, and that's always a good thing when you've got writing going on where something pays off. Somebody knows something about themselves or learns something about themselves that then pays off later in the episode. Payoff is good. Bad movies, bad TV shows don't have payoff. Uh, hey, Larry, how are you doing? Oh, you found me finally? Really? Well, you sh follow me on Twitter, or uh, if, it, if it's not showing up, it should be uh, letting you know um, whenever I go live with the uh, handheld app. So, not sure what to say. Uh, I am going to be here every week at the same time, uh, Mondays and uh, Sundays and Mondays. So, I appreciate you being here, and thank you for following me over. Um, so, with Tosin, we do get some character development here, and we get to see how his backstory impacts this story, um, and he takes what's going on here a lot more personally than he might not if he didn't have this backstory, and it works rather nicely. Um, I, as I say, it's always good when a writer has payoff. Now, you might have done this a little bit more subtly. You might have made us more aware of his uh, mother and all of that in a previous episode so that we could maybe have it a little more gently here as opposed to it being just thrown right out at you and then brought in as the thing that really makes a difference. Um, but either way, either way, we got payoff. We got payoff. Payoff is good. Bad movies and bad TV shows do not have payoff and we like payoff. Although, as I say, as I am the Fandime master, and as I have watched, read, and listened to more than a hundred years worth of science fiction, I kind of saw it coming. But it was okay. It worked. It worked. I didn't mind so much. Then we have a guy I thought was really interesting when I looked him up, playing Dirkus Cicero, the uh, uh, brother of the general and the pilot, is a guy by the name of Ben Bailey Smith. And his um, his Stage name, apparently, I don't know anything about this guy. His, his stage name is Doc Brown. So yeah, we had a Doc Brown in a Doctor Who episode, so that was cute. Uh, you were looking at your 8 p.m. your time, but time change screwed it all up. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's uh, hopefully not fracted up for everybody in existence. This is not going to be a hugely long review. Not like tomorrow's. Oh, God. <laughs> tomorrow is context, boy. Tomorrow is context. Anyway, a guy named who does goes by the stage named Doc Brown is now in a Doctor Who episode, so I thought that was interesting. He is credited, however, as Ben Bailey Smith. 
Uh, he is uh, playing uh, the. Uh, 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 he's playing the, uh, as I say, the brother of uh, the pilot slash general. Um, he has a fine performance. He worked, totally worked, as far as I could. Again, the problem was that I just couldn't buy that his sister would not respect an engineer. As I said earlier on, that's just silly. You know, an engineer, a general, I mean, an en a general, a pilot, they're going to appreciate engineers because while piloting and generaling is great, it won't help if your piloting don't work, you know, if stuff isn't working or it doesn't work right, you know, you're going to have some level of respect, fair amount of respect for the engineers who keep your stuff running, you know. And it's like in Star Trek, you know. Kirk always had lots and lots of respect for Scotty, even though he multiplied his repair estimates by a factor of four. But he knew he was the guy he could count on to get him out of a jam when he needed it, so... Uh, time messed up. You're finding a Doctor Who review. Ironic, yes. Well, you can always go back in time and watch it in the archives, the first part of it that you missed here. Um, that part of it, though, that chunk I mentioned here about uh, Bailey Smith's and, and the character part not working is not Bailey Smith's problem. That, again, is on Chris Chibnall. He's, he, he, I mentioned earlier I was a little... Uh, a little put off by the frenetic pace of this episode uh, in such a way that as an American who's not familiar with a lot of different British dialogues, I'm, I'm familiar with a, quite a number of British dialogues, but there was enough going on here in terms of really rapid paced dialogue constantly moving uh, that I found it occasionally a little difficult to sift through the various dialects to understand what's going on. And again, uh, that would be on Chibnall. Then, Lois Chimimba as Mably, one of the two doctors slash nurses. I'm never quite for sure which is which or if they are doctors and nurses. It came by and went so fast, I wasn't sure. She does a uh, fine performance here. I completely bought her. She was just starting out. She's unsure of herself. And she has to learn during the course of this adventure to be more assertive. It is as often the case, not only with the Doctor's companions, but also with the people and uh, you know, the characters who will show up in these episodes. The adventure that they're having changes who they are as a person. You know, they always... Uh, previous doctors that generally said something like, you're a doctor, oh, do you make people better? And the answer is yes, the doctor does make the people around her into better people, as a general rule. Um, Capaldi probably being the only exception. <laughs> not a fan of Capaldi. Um, not his fault, not his fault. He's a great actor. It's the fault of um, Stephen Moffat, who jumped the shark with the uh, day of the doctor and should have left with Matt Smith. But in any case, uh, you know, no, no problems here with her whatsoever. I thought she did a fine performance. Um, and she is, as many of the uh, guest characters are, somebody who is impacted by this adventure and becomes a better person because of it. We have Brett Goldstein as Astros. Uh, he was our first doctor slash nurse slash I'm not sure which it was because the dialogue came by so fast at me. Um, he does a fine performance here. Unfortunately, and this is one of the things I definitely saw coming. He gets killed pretty early on because they have to prove how serious the situation is. Uh, the number of red shirts on Star Trek who were killed off to prove how serious the situation was. And it's kind of one of those characters. S saw that one coming a mile away. The performance is fine, and that is not uh, Chibnall's fault, the fact that he's used to show just how bad the situation is. That's, that's Chibnall's fault. Chris Chibnall wrote that. That is his fault. Please don't do that, Chris. That part of it I can see coming a mile away, and I dislike that. <laughs> Suzanne Packer plays Eve Cicero, the general slash pilot. I thought she also gave a fine performance. I totally bought her. Uh, interesting thing interesting to me was she's an experienced military pilot who does take command of the situation to some extent, but does subordinate herself to the doctor. And apparently it's because she knows the doctor by reputation, probably through that book that they mentioned. So I did think that that was kind of fun. Um, you know, she, she knows when she's got somebody who should be even more impressive than she is. And she knows when to say, okay, I'm just going to turn it over to you. Uh, 
I uh, also liked the moment, very much liked the moment, and it's a good performance on her part, really good performance, when she said that she missed it, that is piloting. I thought that was a very good performance. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, and I don't uh, know if you were here for it, uh, Larry, but um, one of the cooler things that I liked about this was the notion of flying your ship with your mind. I'd seen it before, I'd seen it before, in a crappy 1977 movie called Starship Invasions, um, but, uh, you know, here, again, works well. I've always thought that was a cool idea. And the notion, of course, that someone is connected up to their ship. I mean, because the way I would envision it, right, would be you would be seeing what the ship sees through its own sensors and apparatus and things like that, and feeling what the ship feels in terms of its own sensors and apparatus. So to be doing that for a long period of time and then not doing it, you know, coming back and saying, wow, I really missed this. I thought it was a really nice moment. Uh, a lesser actress might not have pulled that off as well as she did, and I kind of like that about her. Yas here, the pregnant dude, is played by Jack Shalou. Also think he gave a great performance. Totally bought him the whole time. Uh, Mr. Name, or your name here is uh, different from uh, your name on YouTube. Is, oh, yeah, I figured, Larry. I, I assumed that was you. Yeah, I, I see a Larry down there who says they're following me. Who else could it be? So, yeah. <laughs> um, but, again, I totally bought uh, Jack Shalou. Um, you know, it's, it's just a gender twist thing. You know, you usually have these situations where it's a woman who's pregnant and not sure she's ready to be a mother and all that and going to give the baby up for adoption and all that. And, and so it's just a gender bender thing here where they have a guy doing it. But hey, what the hell? He's an alien. You know, it worked OK for me. And the fact that, you know, Ryan's character development tied in with him and made it so that, you know, it all sort of tied together. And Ryan's telling him, no, no, man, you can do this. You know, the important thing's to be there, unlike my father, who wasn't. So, you know, that I like. Um, his interactions with Ryan, are, they seem right. They seem a, totally appropriate to me. Um, I liked all that, and I thought he did a good job. Um, I have not had the occasion with other of my children to be uh, in. No, I take it back. I was in the room for the birth of one of them. Uh, both of my kids were C-sects. And I was around for the one of them, but obviously it's not the same thing. You know, it's, it's, they're not, mother's not in, a, in a more inordinate amount of pain. It's surgery and, you know, dead from the neck down, so not feeling anything. So, you know, from that perspective, I haven't ever seen that, but I, I'm certainly familiar with it. I certainly have listened to two women talk about it. And so his performance as someone who is giving birth and it's just a normal thing for him it makes sense. Sort of have to question the notion of a kid coming to gestation in only a week, but uh, he's an alien, whatever, it works, it works. Then we have David Shields as Ronan, not the accuser, Ronan the android. And again, I totally bought him. Uh, he is an unemotional android. And you have to wonder, <laughs> is this sort of a nod to Data in Star Trek The Next Generation? And I would have to say, yeah, to some extent it probably is. To some extent, it's probably a nod to Data. Uh, he does whatever's necessary here for his general, which makes perfect sense. He's the general servant. And he's not particularly upset by being shut down. In fact, he doesn't seem to have any particular uh, emotion about that one way or the other. Uh, even though he does have some level of self-awareness. Um, you know, I mean, obviously, it's a question of what you're programmed for. But, I don't know, it didn't strike me as a bad moment, necessarily. He played it totally straight. So, well, I'm going to get shut down. Now I'm done. You know, okay, well, I guess you turn the toaster off when you're finished with it. <laughs> so, <laughs> then we get to the production aspects of this. I'm going to have a little bit to say about this one. Um, direction here is by Jennifer Parrott, which I thought was very good direction. It had a lot of fluidity to it. Uh, Larry says, Data wasn't the first android uh, in uh, media or science fiction. No, 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 by no means. Uh, but given everything else that goes on here, one has to wonder uh, how many different things they're doing that are nods to Star Trek. And one of it was this fluid camera movement that we were seeing. Um, there was quite a lot of it. You may not have noticed, but your brain did. 
a um, fair amount of fluid to camera movement that frankly reminded me a lot of the J.J. Abrams Star Trek movies to some extent. And I think, you know, that was probably intentional. It was probably intentional, particularly given the production design, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, cinematography is by Simon Chapman. Now, I have to give it to him to some extent on this one. Boy, people may not know... But those all-white sets with occasionally what were clearly special effects inserted okudograms. And by the way, if you don't know, okudograms were the flat panel surfaces that you saw in Star Trek The Next Generation and later. They were made up by a guy named Michael Okuda, who was a graphics artist on Star Trek The Next Generation and later. And they were essentially, in that period of time, they would essentially lay a plastic sheet over the top of stuff that he had drawn out and they'd put lights and things underneath it so it would work. But they were like okudograms, except in this case I'm dead certain that they were actually special effects layered in on top of it. So you have these all white sets. Oh lord. You know, J.J. Abrams may make that look easy with all of his lens flares. But shooting in all white sets, especially bright white like these, are hard to do. You know, you have to worry about where you're putting your lights. You know, how are they going to be positioned so that you don't get shadows in the wrong places? Because much like in Star Trek, we had vertical corridors that would intersect with curving corridors that people were constantly running up and down. So you have to worry, okay, we don't want to break up this white. We don't want to suddenly have a shadow over in the wrong place so that it's making it, you know, breaking it up and making it look wrong. And little things like how do we completely light things like alcoves, which they stand in front of repeatedly to have, you know, conversations with each other. How do we light those alcoves so that you're not seeing weird shadows from them? Because um, they're not a normal shape. You know, it's not like a regular wall with a door. These were curved, and then they had an inset into it where the door was. That's harder to shoot than you think. That's harder to shoot than you think. It's one of the reasons why in Star Trek The Next Generation, they didn't use those curved sets from Star Trek The Motion Picture that much. And that's because those things are a bitch to light. Just a bitch to light. Larry says, Okudagram's Jeffrey's Tubes for Star Trek Standard Designs. Yep, absolutely, absolutely were, yep. Yeah, still see Jeffrey's tubes in Star Trek today. I guess can't say that I've heard it on J.J. Uh, Abrams' era Trek, but you know, up through all the way through Enterprise, we heard about Jeffrey's tubes. Yep, named if you're not aware after after Matt Jeffries, the original designer of the Enterprise. But again, the lighting on this more difficult to do than you think. Um, similarly, moving a camera around in it. Now, I wouldn't be even remotely shocked if some of the back some time in the background what we weren't seeing was a green screen. You know, the problem with today is you never know what's green screen and what's not. You know, I've seen stuff in Doctor Who that you know if you look at behind the scenes or things like that, you could say, okay, I understand why that's a green screen there. Like they'll be in Victorian London, standing in front of a window, and so the window's a green screen. You know, the window's like right here. And the window's a green screen behind them because, well, you know, getting Victorian London out your window is a lot easier with a green screen. Hell, it, you know, green screen with the TARDIS here, you know. Um, it's just easier to get. And I'm sure that there were times when that was happening that I was unaware of. And if that's the case, well, good on them. I had no idea where it was. If it's not the case, and they were doing a lot more practical stuff on set, and there was a lot more going on with lighting than I even think there was, uh, got a hand to the cinematographer. This, this is, you know, th this is harder to do than you think. You know, it looks easy when it's all done and said and put together and edited well, but actually getting the shots on a white, bright set like that is tough because of the lighting. In any case, falling back, as I always do, on what do we judge a cinematographer by? Well, you knew what you were supposed to look at, and you could see what you were supposed to see. And that is a lot harder than you think on a nice, brightly lit, white set all the time. So, good for them. Visual effects are by Martin Western. Um, hmm. Boy, the effects here. Uh... Everything except the alien um, looked totally fine to me. Uh, you know, as I say, I'm quite certain, quite certain 
that the uh, visual effects, you know, like the uh, panels and stuff like that, all of that, uh, those were added later. You know, the doctor was actually fiddling, fiddling around on set with blank walls all the time, I'm sure of it. Um, so all of that worked perfectly. That all worked well. The graphics were nice and interactive and, you know, constantly changing. Yay. And I'm pretty sure all of that stuff was just some, you know, the photographic effects. So yay for them. Uh, did a great job on that. Um, but that alien thing. I don't know what it is about it. I did not sit there and frame advance through the 1080p version that I got Oh, about an hour after it. No, it was less than an hour. I started down. I started. I, I got a copy of that. Um, a, a screener. I got a screener of that. About uh, 15 minutes after the air episode finished airing in Great Britain, I had a 1080p screener. Pitorin. Oh, excuse me. Pitorin. Excuse me. But I had a screener of that thing. Uh, I always like to get screeners because it means I can do these reviews, but less, I found, I'm not even sure when it airs on BBC America, but I think it's an hour after I do this review or an hour afterwards. But uh, the alien did not look quite right to me. And I didn't sit in frame advance through it so that I could see, okay, am I seeing lines? Am I seeing a lack of appropriate... Um, detail speculation that's what they call some of that specular stuff is what they put on those to make them look a little more realistic something about it just seemed wrong it looked too much like a cartoon oh i know what it was now it reminded me of that alien from those hawaiian themed um uh, disney movies i don't remember what the alien uh, what that alien's name was now but that's what it reminded me of that's why it looked wrong that's why it looked off, because in the back of my head, I was seeing that alien. Lilo and Snitch, that's it. I think that's it. The, the, one of those two. It looked too much like that, and that's why it was throwing me off. Yep, screeners. Screeners, yes. Yes, if you have access to screeners, you don't have to wait for the BBC America to show it. And you don't have to worry about them randomly pulling 10 minutes out of it so that they can fit commercials into it. I have seen them do it, and it is so annoying because they seem to do it totally randomly. They get to a point in the episode, say, well, we need to stop right here for a commercial, and they yank out three minutes, and then uh, 15 minutes later, whoop, we got to stop right here for a commercial, and they yank out another three minutes of it. Sometimes it's important plot points. Yeah, Lilo and Stitch, that's it. That's what that alien reminded me of. I just did it. Something was bugging me about it, and I didn't get it till just now. That's what bothered me about it. And remembering that in my head, somewhere in the back of my mind, that's what bothered me about that alien, is it looked too much like that, and it struck me as not real, probably because I was remembering that alien in the back of my mind somewhere. Might have worked better if they'd done something slightly different than the alien. I don't know. But in any case, it didn't quite look right. Uh, otherwise... Special effects, visual effects, no problems, no problems whatsoever. I'm sure there were lots and lots of green screens, particularly at that beginning at that dump planet. It had to be nothing but green screen, you know, and, uh, and, and uh, CGI work and stuff like that. So uh, no problem with that. And occasionally they'd have some, I don't know, you can't call them practical. Practical means you do it on the set. I guess I sort of think of it as more practical effects just because, well, it, it's more traditional looking effects, I guess. <clears throat> Excuse me. Production design, again, by R. Will Jones. And uh, this whole ship is bright, the corridors are curved, and it struck me a hell of a lot like the J.J. Abrams era Enterprise in his Star Trek movies. The alien looked alien to our uh, concept of aliens. I don't know. I mean, it did, but by the same token, as I say, now I get it. It was it was the fact that it looked like that alien from Lilo and Stitch, that that I was remembering. It it looks so much like it that I, I get it now. I was having difficulty sorting through my mind why it was that something seemed off, and to me, that's why it seemed off. Maybe I was wrong, but it didn't quite look right. Uh, but again, all this production design that we're seeing here, very bright, very curved. Uh, if they'd had lens flares, it could have damn near passed for the Enterprise under J.J. Abrams. And this was all probably very intentional, probably intentional. And 
not only that, but it served a practical purpose. You're in a hospital, you know, uh, gleaming white, flashing computer screens, and everything looking perfect and pristine. Certainly, land of air of you know being sterile. It wasn't sterile per se, but I mean, it it lent this air that you're dealing with a sterile environment, which would make sense on a hospital. By the same token, I can't help but imagine, you know, you couldn't sit down to do this episode and say, let's make everything white and everything curved and the corridors curved and all that. And we'll have vertical type corridors intersecting with curved corridors, just like the Enterprise. <laughs> Can't help but think, hey, maybe this isn't a nod just a little bit. Um, and in fact, somebody, one of the production staff, I forgot, maybe it was one of the actors who said this, uh, this new season of Star Trek, I mean, of uh, Doctor Who looks like Star Trek. Okay, having seen this episode, yeah, I can agree with that one, yeah. <laughs> Uh, the antimatter drive. Oh, did I get a kick out of this on so many levels. Uh, clearly, clearly a riff on Star Trek's vertical intermix, intermix shafts. Can't imagine that it wasn't intentional. You couldn't do that without not knowing <laughs> that you were doing something that looked a lot like Star Trek, but on a much smaller scale. Except that the way they do the antimatter engine here is a lot smarter in terms of technology. It is really, really stupid to put antimatter tanks into the hull of your ship where they can be fracked up by any number of different things. Somebody with a stray phaser beam down in engineering and boom, you get a big explosion and that's all that. Uh, creating your own antimatter as you go along makes a lot more sense to me. And it also makes sense with respect to the way that it was described as working much like the uh, Large Hadron Collider, um, except smaller, faster, and cheaper, as the doctor said. Uh, makes perfect sense. Uh, it's something that I frankly wish, you know, you know, if you're going to remake Star Trek like J.J. Abrams did, why don't you go that route? Because uh, again, keeping antimatter tanks in the ship is kind of stupid. That's just stupid. And it was, by the way, something that the original designer of the ship never had in mind. That's why in the original series Enterprise, you do not see an intermix shaft anywhere because his whole intention was that the matter and the antimatter are housed in the nacelles. In fact, those big swirling things at the front of the nacelles that look like uh, Christmas tree lights today, that was the matter-antimatter reaction in progress. That was where the matter and antimatter was being mixed. If you read his designs and the making of books about Star Trek made back at that time, clearly he had intended that all of the dangerous stuff, like matter-antimatter reactions, would be happening up in the nacelles, where if necessary, in an emergency, you could jettison them, hopefully before the explosion would have time to blow the ship to pieces. Um, so to me, it's always been stupid. It's always been stupid that you would have antimatter inside the ship. Making it as you go along, a la the Large Hadron Collider, only smaller, faster, and cheaper, makes perfect sense to me. And uh, by the way, JJ, if you're going to go ahead and make, remake Star Trek, why not have done that? We had the Large Hadron Collider at the time. Where it was, in, it was in, uh, in development. They knew what they were going to be. One of the things they were going to be doing was experimenting with making antimatter with it. You know, no reason not to go that route. You know, makes sense to me. And I did get a kick out of the fact that the spaceship control services surfaces were very similar to Okudograms in the respect that they were, you know, flat things that were there on the walls or there on the panels or whatever. Uh, but they appeared and disappeared as necessary. Makes perfect sense. Um, I mentioned before, the problem that you have with Doctor Who is a little different than on most TV shows, with the possible exception of Star Trek. And that is you're dealing with a show that's been around for 50 years. There is every possibility that if they do things right, this show could go on for another 50 years. And uh, as I say all the time in my various reviews, everything dates. Everything. Doesn't matter. If you make it the coolest looking thing right now, in 10 years, 20 years, it's going to look dated. And longer than that, and it's going to start looking badly dated. It's why people my kids' age can't stand to watch Star Trek, the original series, because it looks fake and phony and campy. Now, they don't know that in 1966, that was pretty damn state of the art. It's because it dates. Our technology always outpaces what we think that it's going to be. 
you know, back in Star Trek, they thought what we were going to see is a massive breakthrough in power. What we actually got was a massive breakthrough in computing. Um, so it dates. There's no way to avoid it. And so even when looking at something like this that's supposed to be taking place in the 67th century, a production designer has to ask themselves, okay, how are we going to handle this? Are we going to try to make it look really ultra-futuristic and go out you know, all hog-wild on it? Are we going to make it look as futuristic as we can? Are we going to worry at all about what those people 50 years down the road may have to worry about? And the answer is the latter. You don't worry about it. Um, in uh, the last year's Christmas special, um, they went back in time to uh, a first Dr well, the very last first Doctor episode, The Tenth Planet, and you saw the Doctor and his, and his companions in the context of that episode very, very briefly, but the Doctor is in something that, and the sets are something that are incredibly old school, 50-year-old sets, roughly, that <laughs> dated. They just dated. And the way that the current Who Runners said is, ah, screw it, we're just going to do it. We only have to be in there for a couple of minutes. We're just going to do exactly what they did. We're not even going to worry about it. And so that's exactly what they've done here. They, as always, you have to just do the best you can and say, well, I don't know what it's really going to look like in 50 years. We'll let those guys deal with it if they, if they have to at all. And, and uh, Doctor Who has continued to consistently deal with it that way. You know, aliens that we've seen, oh, God, you know, the, um, the Silurians. Oh, man, if you ever see those guys from the classic series, boy, do they look like guys in rubber costumes. And they updated those guys to look a little more like you'd expect. The um, Centaurans survive pretty much the way that they looked, but the makeup and the, the suits are done so that they're a little more realistic today. Uh, Larry says the first J.J. Abrams Star Trek was a stupid was uh, stupid in showing uh, the Enterprise being constructed on the ground. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, yeah. I, I, the Enterprise has always been designed in the past, was constructed in space, never intended to go on the ground. That said, if you're going to go with, a, with a, a technology that can manipulate gravity, well, you can have it on the ground. It's why I didn't really have a problem in Star Trek Into Darkness when they were uh, on a planet under the water. It's a civilization that can control gravity. There's really no reason you can't do that. I mean, the reason that they didn't, didn't do it in the original series or up until the J.J. Abrams era was because, it, particularly in the original series, it was just prohibitively expensive to even think about trying to land some ship that big. Uh, and they couldn't do it on a weekly basis, so they came up with the transporters instead. But again, if you're going to have a civilization that can control gravity to the degree which they seem to be able to control it in the 23rd century, it's less an issue for me. However, I would not have built it on the ground. I would not have done that. I'd have, I had to put it in a space dock up there someplace, a dry dock. But yeah, I, I, I don't like that so much. You know, when we see it happening, uh, when they go down with a planet with it, I'm like, okay, they have a budget. This is a civilization that can co control gravity. There's no reason they can't do that stuff. And then they just went hog wild with it in uh, Star Trek Beyond. And one of the things I really like is that Yorktown station. There is what I have always imagined a civilization that can control gravity looking like. And I thought it was very, very cool. Yeah, Star Trek Voyager did land on a planet, and again, that's because they had the budget, and I think they were doing CGI by then. I'm not remembering for sure. Uh, obviously, when you can do CGI, you know, you, you're, what you can put on film is limited by the director's imagination and uh, TV budget in that case. In movies, the budget J.J. Abrams had to deal with wasn't even an issue. You, know, you got more money than God, let's do whatever we want. And he did, sometimes not well, but he did. So again, the special effects and stuff, and uh, production design, and uh, the, uh, you know, the, the antimatter drive, and all of that stuff, I thought was pretty well done. Pretty well done here. And again, they took the only route that you can, which is say, okay, we're not going to worry about what people 50 years down the road have to deal with it. We're just going to let people 50 years down the road deal with it. We can't worry about it right now. And, you know, occasionally they do have to come back. You know, I mean, if you look back at 2005 episodes, I think you're going to find there's places in there where things look like maybe they've dated. Now, 
not so much ever with the TARDIS. You know, the TARDIS has always been, you know, in most of the classic series, they tried to keep it making look more and more futuristic as time went on. But then after a while, they just said, eh, it's steampunk. You know, I, every week I come up with, I try to come up with somebody's rendition of the TARDIS. And the TARDIS has always been sort of steampunk, particularly since the uh, 2005 series started. It's always been sort of retro look and, you know, nothing that you would imagine would be that uh, amazing in terms of technology today. But it doesn't matter because it's the most advanced space-time ship in the entire universe, past, present, or future. Well, you can make it look like anything you want. <laughs> Makeup, again, here, uh, concept art was by a guy who apparently looks works for a Millennium FX named Christopher Goodman. Um, I'm not sure what that means in these terms. I would have to assume that it would mean things like uh, the one character who's got, well, I don't know, what I can only think of as trill dots on her face, um, and maybe some other stuff that would use concept uh, uh, um, uh, drawings and artwork and stuff like that for the makeup. Uh, not a ton of that here. Most of the makeup was some level of practical. The hairstylist slash makeup artist is, again, attributed to Amy Riley. Again, the makeup here is largely practical. Now, I did like what they did with Ronan. Uh, they did do a few things with him specifically. That's the android character. Um, can be easy to get that wrong. You know, one of the things that, uh, in retrospect, one of the things that dates about Star Trek The Next Generation is Data's makeup. Why necessarily would you make a guy, a, uh, an android who is a weird albino guy? I mean, in the 23rd century, if you're going to do that, you should be able to very easily make him look like a normal human being. Why, why would you do that? Um, and it's one of those things that, in retrospect, kind of dates. Um, it doesn't bother my appreciation for the character at all. It's just that 20, 30, what, 40 years later? It, uh, 30, I guess. It starts to kind of date. And, and you go, why would you do that? Um, so it would have been easy to get that kind of makeup wrong. Uh, but they did it fine here. Um, he's got some very uh, stylistic stuff done with his hair. Um, doesn't necessarily make him appear inhuman, uh, which I think is an appropriate way to go here. Costume design, as with the previous episodes in this series by Ray Holman. I do like these costumes. Uh, the crew of this ship is all in white, and that enhances, reinforces this notion of sterility in this all-white hospital ship. But again, not it's, it's not only just practical, it's this whole, look how we're doing a riff on uh, modern Star Trek movies thing. Everything is bright. If you had the lens flares, this would have looked exactly like J.J. Abrams' Star Trek. So um, I did like the costumes. They were fine. The other uh, people's costumes tended to be more functional. You know, they did tell us something about the characters. Um, but it still it was enough to look kind of futuristic, but not so much so, you know. Um, a lot of times in science fiction, they'll spend a lot of time with costumes trying to make it look futuristic. Sometimes that's an appropriate way to go, and sometimes it's not. You know, when you're dealing with somebody who's like a military officer or something like that, okay, yeah, I can see that. Um, when you're dealing with just the average schlub, you know, maybe the best kind of costume for them to wear is a t-shirt and jeans. <laughs> You know, I, we don't know. Maybe that stuff will be completely out of style by then. Maybe it won't. Maybe it'll be coming back. Maybe it'll be coming around. Who the hell knows? Who the hell knows? 67th century fashions, who knows? Um, so keeping it just some level of generally practical, you know, a little futuristic looking, but by the same token, um, not trying hard to look futuristic looking. And that's what they t generally do in Doctor Who, by the way. They usually do that. Music, as has been so far in the case in this season, is provided by Sagun Akinola. Again, I continue to like this music. It is not Murray Gold, who had done the music up to this, point, up to this season. But again, who would be? You, as I said before on my views of this, you have to put your own stamp on it. And uh, he's definitely, I think it's a he, uh, putting his own stamp on it. Um, 
there is nothing here yet, aside from like the first episode where we had blaster beams that I recognized. Uh, aside from that, there's nothing on here that just jumps out at me and says, wow, that's freaking amazing. Uh, but by the same token, it matches the action. It is underscoring the action properly.